more of, a, of an influx of, and here the Coreopsis really took off um, this first growing season in this particular phase. In other phases, this same seed mix, we didn't get this much of a flux with the Coreopsis, which is, it, it's really interesting to see. Um, and then this is the upper area, so you can see kind of, you know, the diversity in the, in the herbaceous that, that went in. And then over time, as those trees start to establish, so this is probably about five years after, after it was installed. So you can see the difference, the trees, you know, there's a couple trees in here at this point, and then five years later, these trees really start to become established, so it starts to change. So that's done with this, I think. I think Celia's on. Yeah. Okay. Question. Any questions? Yeah, um, in terms of meadow management, in terms of uh, someone wants to keep it in uh, a meadow all the time, you're suggesting uh, one or two months a year is there a time of the year that's more preferable to mow? Time of year yeah. to actually seed the seed the meadows. Gotcha. Once the meadows are established, uh, okay. What what's kind of the optimum mowing regime or time of the year to prevent the succession? Okay. It's, I'm going to give you a typical scenario because each time it's really kind of dependent on the client and you know the specific needs of the site. But typically it's uh, the first growing season we'll go in and probably we may mow twice. Um, once a couple months after it's established and then another time um, probably about four to five months after that. So. Typically, we like to install the warm season meadows um, before the end of June. So there's a window between like March and the end of June getting those those meadows established. Um, if it if it goes in in March, we'll probably go in and mow uh, in June. But what's critical, and I'll be talking about this a little bit tomorrow, and I have some photos, is making sure that it's not mowed too short. Um, a lot of times they'll go in with regular you know mowing equipment. And mow it down to like here. It's it's a different kind of mowing. You want it to be mowed taller and um, so that you, you get some sunlight down and that those to get the more positions established, but you don't want to buzz cut it and take it take it too far down. So what we'll do is we'll look at a minimal mowing and then sometimes sometimes we'll go back in and we'll mow again in, in say August or September. Sometimes it's just a matter of going in and string trimming down, you know, if you have you know, reed canary or patch of reed canary that's coming in or to, to manage the thistle. So it might be more strategic going in and managing. Um, it really depends, depends a little bit on the metal. Any other questions? Probably just an observation on those plants that struggled. Uh, it's just a great testament <coughs> for, you know, those ornamentals that went in were probably not. Uh, Native to the region, oh, yeah. you know. So, and I don't know if you use you use RPM plants, uh, like with the you know plants that are cultivated in the pot or trimmed or pruned or yeah. You, and I, I, you have a special. I'm nursery. not sure where where those had come from. Yeah. Okay, um, well, I'm pretty sure they were all containers room, but I, I can't remember where those came from. Yeah. yeah. And that is a great slide just to show the contrast with quality plants that are regionally adaptive or even regionally grown mm -hmm. compared to something from North Carolina or down south. It may look pretty for a season, but it's just not going to make it here. Mm -hmm. Plus, those might have been eaten by deer. You know, it was oh, like yeah. a candy store for deer and other mm -hmm. rodents probably. So that's a great example, yeah. really. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you.
introduction to a lot of stuff that I'm going to talk about too. Um, so there will be a little bit of overlap, but I'm going to focus more on how you can get credit for planting trees or stream buffers in terms of the Bay TMDL. So for those of you who were here yesterday, and just a reminder to everyone else, um, at the Chesapeake Stormwater Network, Tom is the stormwater technical coordinator to the Bay Program's Urban Stormwater Work. And that is a bunch of nonsense, but what it really means is how do you get credit for implementing different BMPs in the urban sector towards meeting the Bay TMDL. Um, so just kind of a caveat, I noticed that we have the section on riparian buffers from the Pennsylvania stormwater manual. So you'll see differences in kind of the pollutant reduction efficiencies because these are the ones that have been established for using towards the Bay TMDL, um, not necessarily the same as the state stormwater manual. Um, so tree planting and tree buffers. So I think this is kind of interesting because for those of you who were here yesterday on the second site that we went to on the field trip, the town park, there was a lot of green area. Um, Brian showed us some potential retrofit options. But I also thought that there were other restoration opportunities on that site that weren't necessarily structural in nature. Like I think some of the sustainable landscape information that Kelly just presented would have been a really good option on that site. Obviously, they had a bunch of erosion in specific areas that needed to be dealt with. Um, but incorporating more trees or buffers might have been a better option, um, a cheaper option, than the structural BMPs. So a good strategy for a lot of publicly owned land that's highly pervious in nature, but not necessarily has a lot of trees. So that town park is a good example. Um, reforestation, as we'll see, is, is a relatively inexpensive BMP compared to the other BMPs, but as we'll see, it gets a pretty big credit um, towards the TMDL. Um, many communities already have an existing urban tree canopy goal, so it's kind of piggybacking multiple goals on top of each other, and or as it says, multiple benefits. In addition, we've got kind of these ancillary benefits, so they have a good public health, we hear about energy savings, we hear about mitigating the uh, heat island, ur urban heat island effect, they provide habitat, stormwater management, and water quality as we'll see, and community reinvestment. Oh, I had some questions I wanted to ask you first. Sorry, I forgot. Um, so I guess before I get into it, who, who here has experience with doing like a tree planting project? Okay. Um, so please um, jump in and let me know if you've got other information, um, specific local information. So another reason why you plant trees, again, as part of the Bay TMDL, states and communities were required to put together something called watershed implementation plans. Has anyone heard of the watershed implementation plans? And so basically it was, the Bay TMDL is a pollution diet for the Chesapeake they, when they did that, they said, okay, this is your load reduction. These are the load allocations that each state has to meet. And in order to tell us how you're going to meet those load allocations through a watershed implementation plan, and then the state turned around and said, we're going to do urban nutrient management on this many acres, we're going to do reforestation on this many acres, we're going to do retrofits on this many acres, and that's how we'll bring our pollution loads down. So that's what the WIP stands for. So you can see in Pennsylvania's WIP that they said, and I just pulled out these two BMPs that we're talking about now, they said that they would be planting, so again, the Bay Team meal is supposed to be met by 2025, that they would be putting in 1,400 or so acres of urban tree planting and 15,000, almost 16,000 of urban forest buffers or stream buffers. Um, so in 2009, they hadn't planted any, or at least hadn't reported any, and this would this would equate to about 90 acres per year in order to meet the urban tree planting goal, and almost a thousand acres per year in order, in order to meet the stream buffer goal. And that's a lot. So they're relying heavily on this BMP in order to meet 
their um, commitments. So this is probably pretty basic stuff, like how this, um, the forest hydrologic cycle works. Um, just so we understand different aspects of the, how the trees and the rainwaters and stormwater interact. But so precipitation falls, it lands on the tree. We've got canopy interception and evapotranspiration, so some of that water goes back into the atmosphere, so it reduces runoff that way. Some of the rainwater comes through and through fall. Um, some of it goes all the way down into the litter. And then there's some interception and evapotranspiration right there. And then some of it actually gets down. So you can see areas that are highly forested have a lot less runoff coming off of the property than areas that are just pervious. So yeah, forests and wetlands maintain the best pre-development stormwater hydrology. They have better water quality. They have less um, pollutant loads coming off of them. Other pervious areas, some of these other expert panels, urban BMP expert panels, have found that the other pervious areas have higher runoff. They actually export nutrients much more than the forested areas. Um, and then if we send a lot of urban stormwater to forest and wetland areas, we find that it actually can diminish those areas unless that we kind of reinforce them as Kelly was just talking about. So, this is an example of forest cover in the Gwynn Falls watershed, and this is, I think, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, so it's Maryland. And it's forest cover, over time. And so the green blobs that you see are the forest cover. And if you can see, there's also some yellow blobs. And that is what is called urban high tree density canopy. So you can see over time, we lose that forested area as it's converted to kind of this urban tree canopy because it's being fragmented as a result of development. How can we protect our urban forests? There's sort of three main um, approaches, or at least that's the way we've broken it out. Um, there are ways to conserve existing forests when you're developing the land. There's going back in and retrofitting or reforesting land that's already been developed in order to maintain those trees. And then something we like to call stormwater forestry, or using trees as actual stormwater management devices. So forest conservation techniques is incentivizing the conservation of forest areas during development. So that can be done through zoning techniques, different conservation regulations, stream buffer ordinances, which I'm sure there are a lot of in this area, um, open space design, and clearing restrictions. <laughs> Reforestation during new development is looking, new development or just existing development, is looking at that development and saying, where can we put these trees um, into the existing landscape? Or when we develop it, how can we incorporate more trees into our design? So we can put them in the local median strips, we can put them along the road buffers, um, landscaping the islands and cul-de-sacs, parking lot islands, and the perimeters. So I think Kelly kind of showed us a lot of really good examples of how that can be done. Um, so I, my pictures are not nearly as beautiful. <laughs> but um, so here's some, an example of incorporating trees along streets. So you're going from, going from this, it's not the same street, but going from this to a, a tree-lined street, um, doing it in open space. So you, we, we saw many examples already, but we had big, swaths of pervious cover that's not necessarily being used and being able to incorporate trees. And then again, here's an example of incorporating trees into a cul-de-sac. And so we've got this huge amount of unused and pervious cover. And as long as we can retain our fire engine turning radius, you know, you can incorporate trees and there there should be a credit associated with that. So lastly and what I'm primarily going to focus on is using trees as a stormwater management device. So this is, I guess this is more of like the retrofit. This is more of what we were talking about. 
Um, so again, using them in parking lots to get more interception of the rainwater so we have less runoff actually hitting the ground. Um, using conservation landscapes, so going from turf to something that is either a tree or it's a buffer, but it's, it's not just turf. Um, and then sometimes when infiltration isn't an option, evapotranspiration and interception would help. And then also we can use them to slow erosion and reduce sediment loss. So again, the, this we're going to talk about the crediting for these two different techniques. So currently, there are two options for credits associated with trees and in, in, in stormwater in the urban sector. There, um, there's the urban tree planting credit and then stream buffers. Let's see what those are. So urban tree planting is currently already a credit, but it is being reviewed. They didn't like the existing credit or they didn't think it was generous enough or there were some issues with some of the qualifying conditions. So it's currently being reviewed and so they expect to have a revised credit in December of this year. The new panel, the new credit we'll be looking at is what is the effectiveness of the urban tree canopy on reducing runoff, nutrients, and sediment? And then how does that effectiveness vary by species over time and depending on the site that the trees are being planted in? So how far does it need to be planted from impervious cover to be able to mitigate that? What kind of soil conditions do we need in order to make sure that it's actually treating stormwater and that the tree itself will survive? where it's being placed in the watershed and its distance from the water body and so on and so forth. So that's what they're going to be looking at. So right now the existing credit, which is I'll, I'll show you in just a minute, is not nearly as um, prescriptive. So this one is going to get more into the details. So the current credit really looks at planting trees on an urban pervious areas at a rate that would produce forest-like conditions. So the key here is we want to go from an urban area to a forest area. So if there, this is what the current credit is, so it will be revised. But if the trees are planted as part of the urban landscape with no intention to convert to forest, then they don't count as for credit as urban tree planting. So again, it's looked at a change in land cover. Um, it's going from urban pervious land, which has certain loading rates that Brian showed us yesterday, to forest land. So it's 100 trees planted, converts to one acre of forest. And you can see the reductions, or at least the change in the loading rate. So we're going from, it's effectively going from, this is actually almost 12 pounds per acre per year of nitrogen to about four pounds per acre per year of nitrogen. And so that's actually a huge credit. And very few people are actually taking credit for it right now. Or at least they're, report, they're not really reporting it. But that's a huge way to get those load reductions currently. So some of the qualifying conditions associated with this credit are, I think I already told you, 100 trees is equivalent to one acre of land or forest. Um, it must result in a net gain of trees, so you can't, so when you're planting this forest, you're gonna have some trees die for various reasons, and you might need to replace them, but those replacement trees can't be counted twice, because they don't want double counting. And then any trees planted for mitigation purposes wouldn't count. Can you go back to that a second? <clears throat> uh, one of the things that the last expert panel didn't really address was what are the size of the 100 trees and species and so forth. So <clears throat> there is a lot of opportunity to gain the system. If you plant 100 seedlings on a quarter acre, according to the credit, you get a whole acre for it. So I think <clears throat> um, to avoid the chicanery uh, and until the credit is changed, that basically if, if you Reforest nature of pervious land, that's what the credit is. Uh, and by what means you do so, how many, how many trees, uh, it's really about the reforestation effort 
over that previous area rather than counting on trees. And I think the other part that the panel will be looking at is when we saw some great slides from you about that just a few minutes ago, uh, these trees are not providing their forest benefits for 12, 15, 20 years. And the nice part about the credit is you get it right away. But if it turns out that you have either a hungry deer or other kind of issues and those trees die, uh, you do have to have some kind of long-term maintenance plan to build that reforestation project so that the real thing that goes behind all the credits is they have to be real changes on the ground. There's a tendency for people to, you know, use the rules of thumb and kind of gain things around to maximize what Cecilia's describing. Very generous credit for tree planting. Uh, but I think as when you're putting together your project, your screen buffers and all that kind of stuff, you, you really want to make sure you're giving that real change in the ground and you're following the principles that Kelly was talking about that is sustainable for us over time. Yeah, so something like this probably wouldn't count. <laughs> Um, and I think that gets to kind of what Kelly was talking about earlier. You know, it, that, that big credit is going to draw a lot of localities and say, hey, we should be doing this. But they're, and again, it'll be revised as they do the new expert panel this year and come out with the new credit. They'll have new qualifying conditions. But, um, you know, things like this would not count. Um, that said, finding good reforestation sites can in a watershed can require some work. Um, we just saw from Kelly that there are a lot of opportunities to partner with local watershed groups um, on your restoration efforts. And then, you know, you can reforest on private land, but as far as the credit goes, you're going to have some um, significant tracking and verification issues, just like we see with homeowner VMPs. <coughs> So again, you know, should this count? Is this tree mitigating the stormwater that's on the site? I mean, I think Kelly had a really good point that when you're planting a tree in an urban environment, it really matters. Some of these things really matter, like the site assessment, species selection. Probably didn't plant this tree at this size, right? At one point, it was a much smaller tree. Um, site preparation, planting techniques, but the soils, Kelly talked a lot about the soils and the importance of that, making sure that these trees can survive over time, um, invasive species controls, infrastructure conflicts, and so on and so forth. So some tips and tricks for planting trees on private lands are um, identifying these kind of priority parcels and residential neighborhood, large pervious areas, extra turf area that could be converted to forest. So again, there's a little bit of overlap from our presentations, but um, I think with that residential development uh, adjacent to the, the golf course, that was a really good example of how you can incorporate a meadow and or trees. Um, so involving the homeowners or the residents in the actual tree planting and restoration, that's huge. Um, getting their input and finding out what kind of information that, or I'm sorry, what kind of needs that they have. So, yeah, so on and so forth. So here's some, here are a couple pictures where I think that you could very easily incorporate tree planting. Um, so we've got a couple, and, and again, they're similar to the pre-picture that Kelly showed, but you've got really good opportunity to incorporate tree planting along these streams or conveyance systems. You have big areas of open space that are not being used, they're just being maintained as turf, which somebody has to mow. So let me ask you, what are the best opportunities for planting trees in Altoona that you can just think of the top of your head? Is it private land? Is, it, is there a lot of public land? that could be utilized? Pretty much uh, <clears throat> the private. It's mostly private land. And we do do some uh, urban sidewalk projects that we incorporate tree planting. Do 
degree in the streets. Yeah. Yeah. A couple. We've done a couple projects too for uh, like flood mitigation projects where we've uh, done street plans and large uh, lots. Yeah. So, what are some of the issues that you run into when you're planting trees with these big projects? Like, is it survival? Like I think you mentioned earlier, the deer feast on some of these trees. I think some of the some of the problems we run into is that uh, you know, we're looking at a little park in Duncansville Borough right here where there's a lot of public frontage. It's property owned by the borough, but and there, there are no overhead utilities, so it's a prime opportunity for some sizable street trees. You know, uh, specimen species of street trees. So uh, the problem is a lot of times trees are just seen as a maintenance head. You know, I mean sycamore, well big leaves. You know, a lot of big leaves. You know, blooms and seeds, yes and no. I mean, this is a tremendous legacy, you know, uh, feature, you know, it's a living uh, feature that's going to change the landscape for generations, you know, and, it, and they have a trail that's unbearable in the summer because with benches that you, nobody wants to sit there because it's hot in a you know, desert, arid area, but so that, that's a big proposal. But we have to get over that mindset, you know, the DPW guys are working with Really see it as an you know an opportunity, but have to balance that with the the idea that this is going to create more maintenance. Yeah. But does it really? You know. So the ROI, the return on that investment, is incredible. So we just right. have to you know it's a salesmanship type thing to uh, you know just keep touting the benefits, long term benefits over short term uh, maintenance. Right? Yeah. And finding the right tree for the site, right? Sure. So exactly. Um, if you plant a lot along the streets, you're going to probably have a lot of leaf litter dropping and maybe clogging stormwater inlets and things like that. So just having to maintain that on a regular basis, you know, maybe there's a better treat for that site that doesn't drop so much stuff. Cecilia? Yes. Can I add to your question? Yes, please do. I'm wondering um, how many municipalities have either ordinances or some sort of regulatory driver either for urban trees or for repairing buffers. Anybody? So we were we're growing green. It's like the tree wildlife thing. Yeah, so we have a tree wildlife program. But, you know, so yeah, we don't have a huge repairing thing because we have very little home the frontage by the municipality. All the more which is been treated. Our biggest thing isn't so much our maintenance, but we I guess you know one of us too. We had streetscapes we put in the trees and not everyone but what about 10% of the homeowners would push back and say we don't want trees. Yeah, we don't want trees. Right. So because of maintenance? Trees are dirty.
do you have an urban tree, tree canopy goal as a community, like to reforest or have a certain amount of canopy coverage? Yeah, I, I don't think we do. Um, uh, yeah, that would actually be, that's in our planning department work, public work. Yeah. So I, I would suspect not, but that's something to check into. Certainly, you know, obviously, if you want to give credit. But the other question came up, and when you were mentioning that, it came to my mind is, okay, what does urban reforestation mean? Because our downtown, for example, a lot of our um, uh, structures that exist in the beginning of town is very dense urban areas. And if you move out of that area, it's two or three square miles, and you have a lot more opportunity. But any type of urban reforestation down there, I mean, we do plant in parks, and we do plant in uh, uh, open space areas. Do any type of forest creation would require radically changing a lot of that area, and I don't see that occurring. So, when you talk about getting credit for that, I, I kind of need to see what they mean by intentionally creating an urban forest. I mean, ultimately, it doesn't sound bad, but it's, it's also, I mean, places like Hollywood, for example, are much more likely to do that because their the town was laid out 100 years earlier, and it's actually more of a super dense downtown go around the uh, uh, transportation of the yeah, railroad of New York. So yeah but I don't I don't, I don't need to see specifics on that before I can tell if they're gonna get credit. And I think that's why they're um, reviewing the credit right now is there there weren't enough specifics. And and while it seems silly that picture I showed of the trees is a really urban environment, people are saying, well we're doing this anyway. We're doing this because some residents like it or we're doing it because we have our own urban tree canopy goal. So can we get credit for these trees that we're planting? And so right now, the credit, while it gives you a big credit, like Tom said, is it's not very specific. Did you want to say something? I wanted to point out that the city of Washington and Holidaysburg Grove have street tree commissions, or shade tree commissions, that kind of guide property owners when they want to plant or when they want to do something to the tree that's already there on the street from the home. So that way they plant the right species and maintain oh, the that's trees correctly. Great. But the history thing that, that Lucas mentioned is holidays for borough planted fragment pears probably 20 years ago. They're dirty and, and they collapse. And they, and they collapse. fall down. You know, we get a lot of snow and ice here. So right now they're going through and replacing them. Yeah. So that there's a lot of history with that. Holidays for almost every year wins the Arbor Day um, Street City Tree Award. I forget what it's called. It just was like last month. So they are very active with that in the, in the urban setting. But you're asking about other issues to get over that. Um, and when you started talking about the park we went to yesterday, I don't know if you heard the story, but the conservation district planted, they had a project that planted a lot of shrubs and trees in that area between the pavilion and the stream. And then, like within a day, the kids ripped them out. Yeah. You know, and so they said, how do you protect them until they get established? Yeah. And if you exactly. start with a larger tree, it's more expensive, right? right. We see that a lot in tree planting in, ba in Baltimore City. Yeah. You know, um, a lot of kids hang on the trees and then they, they die. Um, and I worked in one community where they had basically Bradford pears lining all of their streets, and so they were constantly falling down um, during large storms. And I think, I don't know, Kelly, maybe you can help me, but does it have like a life expectancy of 10 years? not that long and, the, and when they wanted to do restoration the community was outraged that they would try to remove these trees but the, yeah yeah neat little local uh, case study just moving back from central new york to central pa um, having been away from my wife's community for about 20 years or so uh, martinsburg pennsylvania is just a little quaint mm -hmm. town in the cove some of you may be familiar with but just a striking contrast to uh just realizing that there's a group of folks in the downtown that are trying to revitalize the little borough there. And uh, they're, they're, most of them are people from outside the area that have seen other quality communities and they move here. And, you know, why can't we have street trees? Why can't we have uh, you know, light posts and, you know, and, and texture, you know, bricks, sidewalks and things? And so they're getting it. They're really, things are happening, good things are happening, but their street trees have been mowed down, died out, you know, 20 years ago. And, some of it is the borough management mentality. They're just weeds. You know, they're, they've been a nuisance forever, and they're gone. There are no street trees in the downtown. 
the only the few holdouts are people that have you know residents that have said no way you're not touching these trees my grandfather planted them and there's these you know and, and they are problematic they're squeezed in between the curb and the sidewalk and they're heaving the sidewalks up so what we've said is this uh, downtown revitalization committee who have been successfully getting grants to put in, implement new uh, accessible sidewalks replacing sidewalks banners street lamp posts uh, textured sidewalks they also want to do street tree program the bad thing is the good the good news is that the per the right of way is so old and so narrow that there is no room to put street trees in the borough right away the good news is that's great because the borough wants nothing to do with trees so the creative solution is simply go back and talk to all the property owners where these big gaps you know we may have 20 30 feet of side lawns where the residents remember that big old tree that grandpa planted and it died and we've just never replaced it and it's just a matter of taking the time to go meet these folks and say you know if, if we would donate a, 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 a tree to you would you be willing to replace the old tree that was once here mm -hmm. on your private property yeah. now we understand it's on your private property we you know 90 percent of the people we've talked to already are waiting for their tree they want their tree mm -hmm. so it's just a simple creative way we're just going to push the street trees back where they should be it'll be on private property and it's out of the borough's hands yeah, so that, that brings up a really good point. So incentivizing it, either through donating it, or cost share, or something else like that, and I've seen a couple communities around the Bay do that. You know, maybe you get a coupon, and you get so much off towards a tree at a specific nursery. Um, but putting trees on residential properties is an existing credit at the Bay program. It is, it falls under resident, it, it's considered a residential BMP. The problem is until this panel comes out with its kind of new credit, it'll, you know, it'll have to be revised as a result. So again, there are gonna be tracking and verification issues, making sure that, that those residents didn't cut down the tree because it bothered them or something like that, but it will be a credit that can be added. It won't have to be 100 trees to convert to forest land, if that, if that makes sense. Um, So again, I feel bad because I'm showing you a lot of pictures that I think Kelly already did, but I think this is another really good opportunity um, for tree planting in a restored stream segment. So you've got the floodplain, you want to allow for the, the runoff or the, the flood waters to spread out during larger storm events, but could you incorporate more trees closer that would be able to withstand some occasional flooding? Um, I think that is pretty good option. I was going to ask you all what you all think is the most effective species for stream buffers, but I think that Kelly's actually going to teach us that in the next session. Yeah, there's, there's a handout, um, too, in the packet. Okay, it sounds like there's a handout in your packet. Um, so stream buffers is also currently accredited BMP for the Bay program. Now here's where this one we'll see is a little different than the, what is the credit in the Pennsylvania stormwater manual. Um, this is also called, referred to as an urban forest buffer, but it's, it's really just a stream buffer. And it's an, the definition is it's an area of vegetation at least 35 feet wide on the side of the stream. It can include trees and shrubs and other vegetation, but it must be adjacent to a body of water. To qualify. So again, the point of this is to just say that these stream buffers are managed in a way to reduce pollutants and manage stormwater. So we recognize that there's a real benefit for any water that's coming down in the drainage area to the stream. Um, you know, any pollutants that may be in that will be removed by the stream buffer. And while the definition is at a minimum of 35 feet, as you see in the in the Pennsylvania manual hand out 100 feet is preferred. So the pollutant reductions at the Bay program, and again, there's that big caveat, um, that you get for a stream, an effectively managed stream buffer as a BMP is a reduction of nitrogen of 25%, phosphorus is 50%, and sediment is 50%. Um, but yeah, really quickly, if you look at your manual, you'll see that you get 
better reductions, at least for sediment um, and nitrogen, using the Pennsylvania one. I would, I would mention that the uh, specifications in this Pennsylvania stormwater manual are a little bit more stringent than the stream buffer criteria. So it's not like you can say, I'll, I'll take the higher number, please. Uh, if you want the higher number, you have to go a little bit wider and a little bit more stormwater. Do you have any feel for whether or not the stream buffer credit will be reviewed and revised in going forward? I think the uh, current credit uh, applies to agricultural watershed. I, I guess there's one for urban. No, this is, this is the urban one. Um, I think in most of the areas that we've been going through, the agricultural stream buffer credit will probably be more appropriate or feasible to use than the urban stream buffer credit. Uh, but the urban stream buffer credit, there's no plans in the next two years to review that. So I think that one will be useful. So some opportunities for incorporating stream buffers um, in your community or in your watershed is, you know, you've got your you've got your wetland and then you've got your 100 foot wetland buffer and then just expanding those areas in between to kind of create those stream buffer and corridors. I mean, it's got multiple benefits. It increases the habitat corridor and so on and so forth. So that's just one little tip and trick. But I didn't spend a lot of time on stream buffers because, like I said, I think Kelly's going to be talking in a little bit more detail in the next session. Um, and then I just want to give a shout out, actually, I think that this is a land studies project. This was one of our winners of our Bubba contest in 2014. They won the stream restoration project. Um, but you can see a nice, you can talk about the project in a little more detail if you want to, I think but you can see the nice buffer that was. That was that this yeah, this is a floodplain restoration in a, within a retirement community, and I think Ben will give you a little more detail about the project. It's such a pretty picture. Did you have any other questions of using either urban tree planting or stream buffers as a creditable EMP? I would just kind of make the, make the general point that uh, of all the practices, tree planting and stream buffers seem to be the easiest to do. But as we've been talking, tree planting and stream buffers are a lot more complicated to actually implement and find appropriate sites than they would seem at face value. So I think. Uh, the important element is to try to find uh, really good sites where you can make it work and avoid the limitations. Kind of get away from maybe worrying so much about individual street trees and working on you know, not huge parcels, but uh, a half acre, a quarter acre, a third acre, a tenth of an acre of uh, places where you can do enough of a product that sign it and kids want to hang out of it. How are they hang on trees in Baltimore? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what some of the watershed groups run into is they, they have these smaller trees and they plant them in tree pits, right? So really urban environment along the sidewalk. They have these tree pits, they plant the smaller trees. The kids will, you know, they're waiting for the school bus or something, grab them and hang on them and just basically destroy them. But if they planted a bigger tree that was more durable, it would cost more money, so they would be able to plant less. So they're kind of like, <clears throat> do we plant more smaller trees that are less likely to survive, or do we plant less, larger but less effective? So it's kind of a tough spot to be in. Okay, that's all I have. It's break time. Um,